Hi everyone, this is Doc Ina, and this is my lecture on office gynecology. To download my lecture on PDF, please go to my WordPress site, Doc Ina Obigaine. Main reference for this lecture is Comprehensive Gynecology 2017, Chapter 7. This is the outline of my lecture. So for the first part of my lecture, I will discuss components of a complete and comprehensive gynecologic history and physical examination. And for the second part, I will discuss some common office gynecologic procedures. So to be able to obtain a complete or comprehensive gynecologic history and physical examination, four qualities have been recognized as potentially important in caring communication skills. That's comfort, acceptance, responsiveness, and empathy. Despite the busy demands of clinical practice, effective communication skills enhance patient satisfaction and patient safety, and it decreases the likelihood of medical liability litigation. So in this box here, we have a list of some components of an effective physician communication, and this includes that the physician should be culturally sensitive, and she should be able to establish rapport with her patient. She should listen and respond to the woman's concerns. She should be non-judgmental and include both verbal and non-verbal communication. The physician should engage the woman or the patient in discussion and treatment options and should convey comfort in discussing sensitive topics. She should abandon stereotypes and check for understanding of your explanations. And finally, she should be able to show some support by helping the woman to overcome barriers to care and compliance with treatment. The annual well woman visit is a crucial part of general medical care. During this visit, the healthcare provider can attend to current gynecologic concerns, promote disease prevention, assess risks for potential disease, and provide the indicated physical examination or tests. This annual health encounter should include healthy lifestyle counseling as well as screening and immunizations as appropriate based on the patient's age and risks. The first visit generally involves taking a complete history, performing a complete physical exam, and ordering appropriate screening or lab test. The physician practicing obstetrics and gynecology should not assume that others are caring for the patient's general medical needs. It may be appropriate to assume the role of her primary physician, with your care including attention to preventive health services depending on the physician's training and skills. In other circumstances, a referral to a primary care provider may be more appropriate to better serve the patient. Here are the components of a comprehensive gynecologic history. So first, the chief complaint. The patient should be encouraged to tell the physician why she has sought help. The chief complaint is a concise statement describing the woman's problem in her own words. So these are questions such as, what is the nature of the problem that brought you to me? Or how may I help you? Are good ways to begin. Next is history of present illness or HPI. The patient should be able to present the problem as she sees it in her own words and should be interrupted only for specific clarification of points or to offer direction if she digresses too far. During the interview, the physician should face the patient with direct eye-to-eye -eye contact and acknowledge important points of the history. This approach allows the physician to be involved in the problem and demonstrates a degree of caring to the patient. Now that electronic medical records are almost universally utilized, the ability to sit and just listen to the patient and provide that direct eye-to-eye -eye contact can be challenging, as providers are often documenting while the patient is sharing her information. A general outline for a gynecologic and general history is given in this box. The outline is given in a specific order for general orientation. The information, however, may be collected through any comfortable discussion with the patient that seems appropriate in the circumstances. It is important that all aspects be covered. A pertinent gynecologic history can be divided into several parts. It begins with the menstrual history in which the age of menarche, duration of each monthly cycle, number of days during which menses occur, and regularity of the menstrual cycle should be noted. 
the dates of the last menstrual period should also be obtained. In addition, the characteristics of the menstrual flow, including the color, the amount of flow, the accompanying symptoms such as cramping, nausea, headache, or diarrhea should be noted. Any vaginal bleeding not related to menses should be noted also, as well as its relationship to the menstrual cycle and to other events such as coitus, the use of tampons, or the use of a contraceptive device. For the postmenopausal woman, the age of last menses, history of hormone replacement therapy, and any postmenopausal bleeding should be noted. The second pertinent point in the gynecologic history is that of previous pregnancies. The woman should be asked specifically to list all pregnancies, including chemical pregnancies, all abortions, whether it be spontaneous and induced, molar pregnancy, ectopic pregnancies. For deliveries, the following information should be obtained. The year of birth, gestational age of delivery, the type of delivery, infant birth weight, and any complications that may have occurred. Next, a history of vaginal and pelvic infection should be obtained. The patient should be asked what types of infections she has had, what treatment she received, and what complications she encountered. The physician should obtain a pap smear screening history, including the date of the last pap smear, the frequency of screening, and any abnormal tests and treatment. The patient's human papillomavirus vaccination status should also be determined. The woman's contraceptive history should be investigated, including methods used, length of time they have been used, its effectiveness, and any complications that may have arisen. All instances of gynecologic surgical procedures should be noted, including office procedures such as endometrial biopsies, vulvar, vaginal, or cervical biopsies, and for any minor or major procedures such as laparoscopy or laparotomy, the following data should be collected. The date, types of procedures, the diagnosis, and significant complications. In cases where pertinent past records, particularly operative and pathology reports should be sought. Sexual history should also be obtained, and specific problems should be evaluated. The history should include whether the patient is currently sexually active or has been in the past. Patients should be asked if they have one or more current partners and if they have sex with men, women, or both. The provider should also inquire about any sexual dysfunction such as dyspareunia or anorgasmia. Symptoms of pelvic pain or discomfort should be discussed fully. Six common questions should be asked about the pain. Number one, the location. Number two, timing. Number three, the quality such as throbbing, burning, colicky. Number four, radiation to other body areas. Number five, the intensity in a scale of one to ten. And number six, the duration of symptoms. Additional questions about what causes the pain to worsen or subside, the context of the pain symptoms, and associated triggers and symptoms may be helpful. The pain should be described noting the presence or absence of a relationship to the menstrual cycle and its association with other events such as coitus or bleeding and bladder and bowel symptoms. The woman should be asked to list any significant health problems that she has had during her lifetime, including all hospitalizations and operative procedures. It is reasonable for the physician to ask about specific illnesses such as diabetes, hypertension, or heart disease that seem likely based on what is known about the woman or about her family history. Many physicians use a history checklist of the most common conditions. Medications taken and reasons for doing so should also be noted, as should allergic responses to medications. The woman should be encouraged to bring all medications, both prescription and over-the-counter drugs, including herbal preparations, to subsequent health maintenance visits. Most women who use complementary and alternative medicines do not offer this information to, to physicians. A history of smoking should be obtained in detail, including amount, the length of time she has smoked, and attempts at quitting smoking. She should be questioned about the use of illicit drugs, including heroin, methamphetamines, cocaine, and prescription drug abuse with narcotics. Any affirmative answer should be followed by specific questions concerning length of use, the types of drugs used, and side effects that may have been noticed. Her use of alcohol should be detailed carefully, including a number of drinks per day, 
and any history of binge drinking or previous therapy for alcoholism. A detailed family history of first and second degree relatives should be taken in a family tree constructed if relevant. Serious illnesses or causes of death for each individual should also be noted. If the woman desires fertility now or in the future, an inquiry should be made about any congenital malformations, mental retardation, or pregnancy loss. Such information may offer clues to hereditarily determined causes of reproductive problems. The woman should also be asked in detail about her occupational and social history. A non-judgmental way to approach this could be to ask her if she is currently working outside of the home. It is very important to determine if she is currently exercising, what type of activity she engages in, and the frequency of exercise. Additional information that may be relevant include hobbies and other avocations that may affect health or reproductive capacity. For the physical examination, the patient should disrobe completely and cover herself in a hospital gown that will ensure warmth and modesty. The examination should begin with a general evaluation of the patient's appearance and affect. Her weight, height, and blood pressure should be taken initially, and the body mass index should be calculated, and this is an important vital sign to track over time. Most gynecologists will not perform a comprehensive screening of the head, eye, ears, neck, and throat examination. The American Academy of Ophthalmology recommends that adults with no signs or risk factors for eye disease should receive a baseline comprehensive eye evaluation at age 40 and then every 2 to 4 years until age 55, every 1 to 3 years through age 64, and yearly to every other year for individuals 65 years old and older. The thyroid gland should be palpated for irregularities or increase in size. Discrete areas of enlargement, hardness, and tenderness should be described. The patient's neck should be palpated for evidence of adenopathy along the supraclavicular and posterior auricular chains. In a comprehensive preventive health exam, both the chest and cardiac system should be evaluated. When performing the chest exam, the chest should be inspected for symmetry of movement of the diaphragm and observed for respiratory effort. This is followed by palpation, percussion, and auscultation. The heart should be examined by palpation for points of maximum impulse, percussed for size, and auscultated for irregularities of rate and evidence of murmurs and other adventitious sounds. The patient's heart should be auscultated in both the lying and the sitting positions. An older woman's neck should be auscultated for evidence of vascular brewy. For the breast exam, there is no evidence-based recommendation for when to begin clinical breast exam screening in the low-risk asymptomatic woman. The ACOG, American Cancer Society, and National Comprehensive Cancer Network all recommend CBE or clinical breast exam every 1 to 3 years for women ages 20 to 39 and yearly thereafter. A careful breast exam should be carried out in a systematic fashion. To summarize a detailed clinical breast exam, we refer to the box in on the right. Research has shown the following factors are associated with a high-quality breast exam. Longer duration, thorough coverage of the breast, a consistent exam pattern, use of variable pressure with the finger pads, and use of the three middle fingers. The ACOG, the ACS, and the NCCN all recommend the teaching of breast self-awareness, including teaching of breast self-examination. Women are no longer instructed to examine their own breast monthly, but rather if they feel or see any concerning symptom or abnormality such as redness, pain, skin changes, or a mass. For the abdominal exam, the abdomen should first be inspected for symmetry, scars, masses, distension, and visible organomegaly. The hair pattern should also be noted. The typical female escutcheon is that of an inverted triangle over the mons pubis. The physician should listen or auscultate for bowel sounds. Hypoactive or absent bowel sounds may imply an ill use caused by peritoneal irritation of the bowel. Hyperactive bowel sounds may imply intrinsic irritation of the bowel or partial or complete bowel obstruction. Next, abdominal percussion affords the ability to differentiate fluid waves and to outline solid organs and masses. Localized percussion tenderness 
may suggest peritoneal inflammation. Finally, the abdomen should be palpated for organomegaly, particularly involving the liver, spleen, kidneys, and uterus, and for adnexal masses which may be palpated abdominally if large. Palpation affords the possibility of noting a fluid wave, which would suggest either ascites or hemoperitoneum. For the pelvic exam, the pelvic examination is conducted with a patient lying supine on the examining table with her legs in stirrups and a sheet draped across her. The physician should be sure that the patient is as relaxed as possible and should take a few minutes to describe the procedure and allow the patient to prepare herself. For the inspection, the vulva and introitus should be carefully inspected beginning with the mons pubis. The quality and pattern of the hair on the mons and the labia majora should be noted. During the inspection of the pubic hair, the physician should look for evidence of body lice. Next, the skin of the vulva or the perineum is inspected for erythema, excoriation, discoloration, or loss of pigment and for the presence of vesicles, ulcerations, pustules, warty growths, or neoplastic growths. In addition, pigmented nevi or other pigmented lesions should be noted also, as should varicose veins. Skin scars denoting previous episiotomy or other obstetric laceration should be noted. Next, the specific structures of the vulva should be systematically evaluated. Specific structures of the vulva should be systematically evaluated. The clitoris should be noted in its size and shape described. Normally, the clitoris is 1 to 1.5 cm in length. Any irregularities or abnormalities of the labia majora or minora should be noted and carefully described. At times, these areas are injured by trauma related to coitus, accidental injury, or childbearing. The patient should be questioned about evidence of trauma when appropriate. The introitus should be observed closely, whether the hymen is intact, imperforate, or open, and whether the perineum gapes or remains closed in the usual lithotomy position should be noted. The perineal body, the area at the posterior aspect of the labia where the muscles of the superficial perineal compartment come together, should be inspected. It represents the focal point of support for the perineum and is between the vagina and the rectum. The perianal area is then inspected for evidence of hemorrhoids, sphincter injury, warts, and other lesions. The opening of the vagina should be inspected for presence of a cystocele or a cystourethrocele, and this is seen as a bulging of the vaginal mucosa downward from the anterior wall of the vagina. The next step in the examination of the perineum involves palpation. The labia minora are gently separated, and the urethra is inspected, and the length of the urethra is palpated and milked with the middle finger. In this way, irregularities and inflammation of the skin glands, expressed pus or mucus, or a suburethral diverticulum can be noted. Any pus expressed from the urethra should be submitted from gram stain and cultured because it is occasionally found to contain gonococci. Next, the area of the posterior third of the labia majora is palpated by placing the index finger inside the introitus and the thumb on the outside of the labium. In this way, enlargement or cysts of the Bartholin glands are noted. This exam should be performed on each side. After palpation, the physician chooses the appropriate speculum for the patient, and we do the speculum exam. The most commonly utilized are the Grave and the Peterson Speculum. The Peterson Speculum is narrower and may be more appropriate for virginal or newly gravid women, women with a history of sexual abuse or vaginal pain. The speculum should be warmed, either by a warming device or by being placed in warm water and then touched the patient's leg to determine that she feels the temperature is appropriate and comfortable. Judicious use of a water-based lubricant can facilitate a more comfortable exam for the patient. The speculum is then inserted by placing the transverse diameter of the blades in the anterior-posterior position and guiding the blades through the introitus in a downward motion with the tips pointing toward the rectum. Because the interior wall of the vagina is backed by the symphysis pubis, which is rigid, pressure upward causes the patient discomfort. 
It is avoided by following the described method of introducing the speculum. Also in the resting state, the vagina lies in the rectum and actually extends posteriorly from the introitus. Placing two fingers into the introitus and pressing down may facilitate the procedure. Once the blades are inserted, the speculum should be turned so that the transverse axis of the blades is in the transverse axis of the vagina. The blade should be inserted to their full length and then opened so that the physician may inspect the position of the cervix. If the cervix cannot be visualized with the positioning of the speculum, the physician should inspect for the position of the cervix with his or her finger and then reinsert the speculum accordingly. Once the blades are inserted and the cervix is visualized, the speculum should be opened and the introitus widened so that the cervix can be adequately inspected and any indicated specimens obtained. The physician then inspects the vagina and the cervix. The vaginal canal is inspected during the insertion of the speculum and upon its removal. Bimanual examination allows the physician to palpate the uterus and the adnexa. The lubricated index and middle fingers of the dominant hand are placed within the vagina and the thumb is folded under so as not to cause the patient distress in the area of the mons pubis, clitoris, and pubic symphysis. The fingers are inserted deeply into the vagina so that they rest beneath the cervix in the posterior fornix. The physician should be in a comfortable position at this point, generally with the leg on the side of the vaginal examining hand on a table lift and the elbow of that arm resting on the knee. The opposite hand is placed on the patient's abdomen above the symphysis pubis. The fats of the fingers are used for palpation. The physician then elevates the uterus by pressing up on the cervix and delivering the uterus to the abdominal hand so that the uterus may be placed between the two hands, thereby identifying its position, size, shape, consistency, and mobility. In the normal and non-pregnant state, the uterus is approximately 6 cm by 4 cm and weighs approximately 60 grams. It may be somewhat larger in a woman who has had children. Enlargement of the uterus should be described in detail. Size may be estimated by in centimeters or by comparing with weeks of the normal gestational age. The majority of women will have a uterus that is underverted with the uterine fundus tipped forward. In the antiflex uterus, the fundus points anteriorly as well. The uterus may be retroverted in which the entire uterus tips posteriorly and may also be retroflexed in which the fundus points posteriorly. If it is positioned in a straight line with the vagina, it is said to be mid-position or neutral. A markedly retroverted uterus that cannot be brought forward by manipulation is best inspected by rectovaginal exam. A markedly retroverted uterus that cannot be brought forward by manipulation is best inspected by rectovaginal exam. The general shape of the uterus is that of a pear with the broadest portion at the upper pole of the fundus. Generally, the uterus is mobile, and if it fails to move, it may be fixed by some adhesions. The surface should be smooth. Irregularities may indicate the presence of uterine lymphoma. The shape of the uterus should also be described in detail. The consistency of the uterus is generally firm, but not rock hard, and this should be noted in the exam. The first two fingers of the right hand are moved into the right vaginal fornix while the abdominal hand is placed just medial to the anterior superior iliac spine on the right and vice versa. The normal ovary is approximately 3 by 2 cm, that's about the size of a walnut. And the left and next side should be palpated in a similar fashion by turning the vaginal hand to the left vaginal fornix and repeating the exercise on the left side. After completing the vaginal portion of the bimanual exam, the middle finger is relubricated with a water-soluble lubricant and placed into the rectum, while the index finger is maintained in the vagina. Now, we can perform the rectovaginal exam. Rectovaginal septum is palpated between the two fingers and any thickness or mass is noted. Any thickening or nodularity of the structure may imply an inflammatory reaction or endometriosis. Now for the second part of our lecture, we discuss some of the most common office gynecologic procedures. First is the pap smear or the Papa Nicolaou smear. 
In 1943, Papa Nicolau and Trout demonstrated the value of vaginal and cervical cytology as a screening tool for cervical neoplasm. With the use of the pap smear and screening programs, the incidence of invasive cervical cancer was reduced by 50%. In 2012, the ACOG, ACS, and U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommended the following. Initial screening with pap smear should begin at age 21 regardless of sexual activity. For women ages 21 through 29, screening should occur every 3 years. Women ages 30 to 65 can either have co-testing, that's pap smear plus high-risk human papillomavirus test, or just a routine pap test. Repeat co-testing occurs every five years whereas pap testing alone continues on every three years. Pap smear screening is no longer recommended for women age 65 and above if she has had normal adequate testing over the past 10 years and she has not been treated for high-grade dysplasia within the past 20 years. Exceptions to the above schedule include HIV seropositive women, immunosuppressed women, and women exposed to DES in utero. No pap smear screening is necessary after a complete hysterectomy done for benign conditions. However, if a supracervical hysterectomy was performed, meaning the cervix was not removed, the same screening guidelines pertain as if there had been no hysterectomy since the cervix remains, remains inside too. The goal of the pap smear is to collect cells from the transformation zone of the cervix and the presence of adequate endo- and ectocervical cells ensures that this area is captured in the specimen. So how do we do the Papa Nicolau smear or pap smear? After excess mucus is gently removed, the endocervical canal is sampled with a cytobrush which is placed into the canal and rotated. A spatula is then used to collect ectocervical cells. So this picture on the right, the upper right, is a spatula, and the picture on the lower right is a cytobrush. A single broom-like sampling device, also called the cytobroom, can also be used to collect both populations of cells in a single step. So you no longer have to use a separate cytobrush and a spatula when you're using a cytobroom. The collected material is placed in the liquid preservative solution. Or, the collected material can also be smeared on a glass slide and fixed with a fixative. HPV testing can be concurrently ordered from the collected sample if the collected material was placed in the liquid preservative solution. Here is an example of a pap smear official report. The first part of a report states whether the sample is satisfactory or unsatisfactory. A sample may be unsatisfactory if there is a lack of a label, loss of transport medium, scant cellularity, and contamination by a foreign material. The second part is that the report indicates whether the cellular material is normal. If other than normal, the abnormalities are further divided into squamous and glandular. And for the last part, the cytologist may also comment on whether there is evidence of infection such as yeast or changes consistent with the diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis. Second is the endometrial biopsy. Endometrial biopsy is endometrial sampling using a curette, and this is used for investigation of abnormal uterine bleeding. Endometrial biopsy helps in diagnosing benign, malignant, or premalignant endometrial lesions. The contraindications to endometrial biopsy are the following, pregnancy, acute pelvic inflammatory disease, cervical cancer, acute cervical or vaginal infection, and cervical stenosis. The third is hysteroscopy. Hysteroscopy is a direct visualization of the endometrial cavity via the cervix using an endoscope and a light source. Various infusion media are used for uterine cavity distension, which is necessary for inspection. And this includes water or gas. Many surgical instruments and devices are available for diagnostic biopsy and pathology removal and therapeutic procedures. Hysteroscopy is most frequently used in the evaluation of abnormal uterine bleeding for both pre- and postmenopausal women. 
Colposcopy is often the first step in evaluation of women with abnormal cytology. The colposcope is a low-power binocular microscope with a powerful light source that is used to carefully examine the cervix. The instrument is placed just outside the vagina after a speculum has been inserted and the cervix brought into view. After any obscuring mucus is removed with the swab, the cervix is carefully examined for the presence of lesions. Dilute acetic acid, the 3 to 5 percent concentration, is applied to the cervix, and after 30 to 60 seconds, the cervix is again examined. Acetic acid dehydrates the epithelial cells and dysplastic cells with the large nuclei, will reflect light and appear white. An experienced colposcopist can distinguish those tissue patterns associated with cervical dysplasia from normal epithelium. For a thorough and complete exam, the entire transformation zone must be assessed. If some portions of the transformation zone cannot be visualized as they extend into the endocervical canal or for other reasons, the colposcopy is considered unsatisfactory as the examiner is unable to determine the presence or extent of abnormal tissue. In the case of abnormal cytology and an unsatisfactory colposcopy, it is recommended that an endocervical cure touch be performed. Cervical biopsy should be performed for any acetoid lesions. Next is cryosurgery or cryotherapy, and this is the use of extreme cold produced by liquid nitrogen or argon gas to destroy any abnormal tissue. And this is used to treat any external tumors for the ablation of benign and premalignant lesions of the cervix, vagina, and the vulva. For external tumors, liquid nitrogen is applied directly to the cancer cells with a cotton swab or spraying device. Next is vulvar biopsy. Vulvar biopsy is performed to diagnose lesions or skin changes on the vulvar epithelium. For small lesions, vulvar biopsy may excise and treat the entire lesion. The indications for vulvar biopsy include the following. Visible lesion for which definitive diagnosis cannot be made on clinical grounds, a possible malignancy, visible lesion with presumed clinical diagnosis that is not responding to usual therapy, lesions with atypical vascular patterns, benign appearing lesions requiring definitive diagnosis, and white lesions failing empiric therapy. Next procedure is the cervical biopsy, and this procedure is used to remove tissue from the cervix to test for abnormal or precancerous conditions or cervical cancer. A cervical biopsy may be done when abnormalities are found during a pelvic exam. It may also be done if abnormal cells are found during a pap smear. Next is sonohysterosal pingogram or saline infusion sonography. This is a procedure to test the patency of fallopian tubes. It is best to schedule this procedure during the week following the end of menses to avoid a possible pregnancy and also get better definition of the uterine cavity when the endometrium is still thin. Prophylactic antibiotics should be given prior to doing this procedure, and this is in the form of doxycycline, 100 mg twice daily for at least 3 days, starting one day before the procedure. Now, if a hydrosalpinx is seen, doxycycline should be continued for one week. Next procedure is office systometry. This is a urodynamic test that measures the bladder pressure during the filling phase of the micturition cycle. The first urge to void, the normal desire to void, and the bladder capacity are noted. So the woman is instructed to cough or to perform the valsalva maneuver so that the physician can detect stress incontinence in the absence of a detrusor contraction. So how do we do this? So an aseptic syringe is attached to the indwelling folic catheter and 50 ml increments of saline is infused. So we note the bladder volume at the first urge to void and bladder capacity is also determined by instilling saline until the patient feels unable to hold any more. The normal values are for a residual urine that should be less than 50 ml, where the first desire to void should be at around 150 to 200 ml of urine and the bladder capacity should be around 400 to 500 ml of fluid.
There is this procedure that we call the bony test. And how do we do this? So the fluid is drained from the bladder until 250 ml fluid remains. The patient is instructed to cough. And if urine spills, then there's urinary incontinence. The examiner's finger is applied against the anterior vaginal wall at the pubovesical angle. The patient is asked to cough. If no urine spills, then the surgery will correct the urinary incontinence. The last procedure is cystourethroscopy or simply cystoscopy. And this may be performed with a flexible or rigid telescope that allows visualization of the urethra, bladder, and urethral orifices. Generally, saline or sterile water is used for the infusion fluid to expand the bladder. Local lidocaine jelly is inserted into the urethra for analgesia. Well, the patient can also be subjected to spinal anesthesia as a form of anesthesia. The bladder may be visualized and the presence of inflammation, foreign bodies, urinary tract stones, anatomic abnormalities such as duplicated ureter or benign or malignant lesions are noted. So that's it. So as a summary, we have discussed the components that are very important in a very complete and comprehensive gynecologic history and physical examination. And we also discussed some common office gynecologic procedures. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to subscribe in my YouTube channel, Ina Irabon, and my WordPress site, Doc Ina Obigaine. Thank you.